again for Talking Dogs with Ian Grant, owner of Vermont Dog Boarding and Behavior, VFW Drive in Hyde Park. It's the show that delves into the training, socializing, behavior, and nutrition of your dog. And brought to you by Guy's Farm and Yard with locations in Morrisville, Montpelier, Williston, and St. Albans. And we're back with the trainer, Ian Grant, and today we're talking about puppy biting. And it may seem kind of cute, you know, if you're coming into a house and the... And the dog, uh, yeah, just kind of bit a little bit. Isn't that cute? Well, not really, <laughs> because this is one of those uh, issues that you need to deal with right up front. Yeah, and the other part of it, too, is in the springtime, we see a huge amount of people adopting puppies. Puppies love to put things in their mouth, number one. That's how they're going to test it. Is this food? Is it not food? Is this a cord with an electrical current in it? What's going <laughs> to do it to me? Is it the trim? Is it the furniture? What is it? And so this is actually a very natural behavior, but for us not being dogs and them having hundreds of pins and needles in their mouth, it can be painful to us in many different ways. And so we have to look at this and number one, we have to make sure the dog is being fulfilled. We, we talk about this, whether it's training or walks or exercise or playtime, that's number one, because if that's not happening, this puppy biting is going to be way worse than we can imagine. Right, because you're not uh, you're not diverting their attention and keeping them stimulated. Yeah, like right now I'm in the midst of a couple of uh, puppy lessons, a series, and dealing and helping out some uh, clients with puppy biting. And so with puppy biting, number one, we want to make sure that we're giving them something to chew on that's <laughs> acceptable. So whether it's a Kong with some frozen peanut butter or yogurt, something like that in it, or frozen pumpkin puree that we've talked about many times here, we want to give them something that is they're allowed to chew on. You can also try a bully stick or a marrow bone, just something that's going to divert their mouth off of our hands. So that's the first thing that we have to look at is making sure that we're providing something that's acceptable to chew on. Okay, so that will divert them from chewing on anything else? What would lead them to, okay, I'm chewing on this, and now they go into another part of the house and they're chewing on something else? What diverts them from continuing on other ways i think we have to look at structure so if we can't as a puppy as and look i just went through this right with my two dogs so (laughs) it doesn't matter who you are you're not immune to what the dog goes through right i always was a big proponent on tethering may and Gemma when they were younger especially when i couldn't keep track of them so when we're up in the morning we're getting ready for work and we're getting the kids breakfast and all that we don't have time to stare at our puppy the whole time so especially with Gemma, we would give her a frozen kong i would tether her to a crate that was bigger than her and she she would chew on that thing and lick it and kept her occupied and we could do our, our normal mornings. So if you can't if you can't watch them, we have to tether them. If you can, then by all means follow them around the house. But I'm a big proponent of letting them drag a leash around the house. Just a small, cheap leash, something that you don't care about. Uh, because when that little chainsaw of a mouth turns to you and like, hey, I think it's time to chew on you, I just grab the leash. I'm just gonna pull a little tension up on it, just say no just for them to stop, and then I'm going to drop the leash. I have to communicate with them that this isn't appropriate. If we look at this as a big picture and go, okay, I'm going to teach the dog when not to do it, but also show the dog this is something that you can chew on, that's where I feel like we're being a little bit more fair and respectful to the dog instead of just this overall huge correction after correction after correction. Now, always the assessment is that uh, the dogs do that, puppies do that, because they're teething. Mm -hmm. Now, is it just that, or is it just something that, uh, that they're just learning and it's just something for them to do because they've only been on this earth a few months. So. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So it actually can be both happening. So they can do it before the teething ever starts and then they could do it during teething too. And to me, if, if we see a increase in the puppy biting, I might up my exercise regimen for the dog a little bit just because maybe they're getting a little pent up. They might be a little frustrated to a degree. And that's why I like giving them something frozen. I mean, look what we did for our babies when they're teething. It was like, just give them something cold, right? It might help the teeth or the gums, whatever pain that they might be feeling. But I, I want to try to take that away from them as much as I can, just kind of relieve the pressure or relieve the pain or relieve the frustration just to just to help them through that process. Yeah. And how important it is to get to it early as a puppy, because otherwise, as you're going down the road, does this usually lead to nipping and beyond that? It could. I think for puppies, they're still in the, that exploratory phase when they're doing this kind of thing. What can I do? What can I not do? Because they're also, they were doing that with their litter mates not too long ago, chewing on each other. And when one of them yelped, it all of a sudden stopped the biting. Yeah. 
And so, I mean, that's another technique that you can use is if you want to pretend like you're going to yelp and really kind of move quickly back and that might get the dog's attention too. But it is natural to a degree, but there are things that we can do to help curb the behavior. Right. And like anything else with puppies, you train them early. Please, please, please. Please, please do that. <laughs> and if you need some help, Ian is always available. I know somebody. Good. Me too. <laughs> back with our question from the doggy bag in just a moment here on Talking Dogs. Are you looking to live a better life with your dog? Want help with what's not going so well? Want to learn to read your dog's body language? Subscribe to the Canine Cooperative, my new Facebook community of dog owners and my clients who want to live a more fulfilling life with their dogs. For $19.95 a month, the Canine Cooperative gives you personalized, real-time training help in a supportive community of fellow dog owners. Join the Canine Cooperative. Go to vermontdogboardingandbehavior.com slash cooperative and subscribe today. That's vermontdogboardingandbehavior.com slash cooperative. Back with Talking Dogs with Ian Grant from Vermont Dog Boarding and Behavior, VFW Drive High Park. You can go to his website, vermontdogboardingandbehavior.com, to find out more about the different programs, his facility, and you can latch on to podcasts of this show and others that are available right on the front page, right there. Uh, just click on podcasts and away you go. And you're up to how many? You're we're over 400 Over now. 400 now. Yeah. Wow. Well, we're over 240 shows. In fact, this is number 241 for those of you counting at home. So there you go. Our question this morning, Ian, is, is it okay to let my dog sniff the ground while I'm walking him? You know, Tika, she would, if it was up to her, she would sniff every 10 feet, you know? <laughs> I would never get any walking done. So so is there, uh, you, you probably want to allow him to do some sniffing, but is there a limit or is there kind of a procedure you need to go through? I have to tell you, I recently interviewed a, a trainer from England and, and she was talking about the power of a dog's nose and how actually letting them sniff can be more tiring to them than going for a walk even. And so my brain has been spinning for <laughs> since this uh, new revelation kind of came about. I mean, trying to figure out this. what's what's best. What's best? I mean, I'm exhausting my dog because, uh, I'm, or I'm I'm just exhausting the whole dog, not just her nose. Then. Yeah, because as much as Tika's sniffing, she's having to process all those smells and what is it and where is it coming from and can I track it or trace it or you know what's going on. I've always been a big proponent on just creating an area for your dog to go sniff. Maybe not letting them, you know, in between. So if you leave the house, you go for ten minutes and then walk off to the side of the trail or the road or whatever, and just let them sniff. Let them take it in and you being the one in control of that after hearing this too i think to a degree there has to be a happy medium of yeah i'm gonna let you sniff but i don't want you to be pulling me way to the left like we're gonna walk down into a ditch and you know like that's not gonna be fun for probably anybody so i i don't think it's a big problem if you let him sniff but we want to also be able to have control of our dog during the walk so if you can have the control and still let him sniff to me, that's the win-win scenario. Yeah, to try to balance it out somehow. Yeah, because their nose can take them, right? I mean, <laughs> and who knows where. Look, a fun exercise for you to do is actually walk out the door and just let the dog lead you for the entire walk. Just go wherever they go within reason, right? We're not going to go through somebody's backyard. Right, and stop whenever they stop? Yeah, why not? Just yeah. test it out. I think you'll be kind of surprised at the result. We've done it with a few dogs at work, and it's crazy to see what they do when it's really – totally left up to them. There's a lot going on in that mind per sniff. Yes, there is. Absolutely. Yes, <laughs> yeah. there's a lot to process. Yeah. If you have a question for Ian, you can email him directly to info at vermontdogboardingandbehavior.com. Next week, your dog and getting on the furniture. Of course, everybody has their own sentiment about whether the dog should be on the furniture or not. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, this is uh, sometimes can be a double edged sword, but uh, I, I think you might be surprised at my answer. You don't surprise me too often, but, <laughs> but I'm willing to be surprised next week. <laughs> Sounds good. On Talking Dogs with Ian Graham, brought to you by Guys from and Yard, with locations in Morrisville, Montpelier, Williston, and St. Albans. And for the trainer, Ian Grant, I'm Roland Joy, and we are Talking Dogs.